Hey class, uh, this is Instructor Jensen, and this is my friend Vincent. Today we're going to be talking about natural law um, as we're going through normative ethical theories. Um, we're looking at one really important one, um, especially as far as I understand it in the Catholic tradition. Um, so, yeah, uh, Vincent, tell us about yourself. Tell us, tell us where you teach, how long you've been teaching, how you got into philosophy. We want to hear all of it. All right, sounds good. Well, um, I'm Vincent, uh, Vincent McCoy, Professor McCoy, as you wish. Um, I teach at St. Leo University, which is a little uh, private Catholic university down in, down in the state of Florida. Um, I also have a lot of my other my lectures on this topic and other topics uh, on the, this the same YouTube channel. So, and I'll have some of those uh, linked as well. So, if you're wanting to know more about these specific topics, I've got plenty on it um, beyond uh, beyond just this. Um, I've been teaching, uh, I've been teaching at the uh, at the university level for eleven years now, between TAing and and solo teaching. Um, I um, I've I got into philosophy just as an undergraduate. I, funny enough, I wanted to go to law school when I first started uh, my undergraduate, um, and so I was doing like a pre law program with uh, political science. But then I discovered that political science is more science than political theory, and I discovered that philosophy is just really interesting. And so um, about, what was it, three or four weeks into my first semester of university, I switched majors. And uh, I wound up double majoring in philosophy and history. Um, and I've been doing, I've been doing uh, philosophy primarily in the, the sort of scholastic medieval period uh, ever since. That's been my, my area of academic expertise, my research interests. Um, all that, and so it, it fits really well with uh, within uh, this particular framework of uh, of natural law theory, since it was sort of the prominent, or at least the most prominent, um, maybe next to virtue theory, um, uh, the most prominent way of approaching ethics throughout the medieval period, both in the Christian West and uh, and throughout most of the world that at least was in contact with it. Wow. So uh, you would also say that. Your specific focus is ethics, not just scholastic philosophy, or would you say scholastic philosophy in general in all sorts of topics? So scholastic ethics and metaphysics, really specifically, uh, and especially yeah. where those two intersect, so, which which also has a lot to do with natural law, which which we'll get to. Um, so partially, it's uh, it, that's my really specific area of expertise, uh, which every academic winds up getting at some point. You'll get that that hyper focus on on like one or two or maybe three people in history, um, or one or two or maybe three ideas, uh, and just hyper focus on one thing. Uh, that said, I've done a lot of uh, I've done a lot of you know corollary research and uh, and I've learned a lot about other philosophical topics, other things that have to do with metaphysics, that have to do with ethics. That have to do with a lot of the background for uh, for what the medieval studied. So I've read a lot of Plato. I've read a lot of Aristotle. Um, I've read some of the modern thinkers as well. I've had a lot of professors who were really uh, really deeply ingrained in the 20th century continental tradition. So the existentialists, the the uh, phenomenologists, that sort of thing as well. So I have a broad enough uh, broad enough base uh, base of knowledge, but with with that sort of hyper focus that you'd expect from any of an academic. Great. Well, thanks for sharing about that. Um... I see, I see no reason why we couldn't just start getting into the topic. So tell us about right. the basics of natural law. All right. So broadly defined, um, natural law is a, a system of ethical thought that is based upon the natures of things, the essential natures of beings under examination. Specifically, natural law refers to um, the specifically human nature uh, and acting in accordance with human nature, and then acting, uh, interacting with other things according to their natures as they relate to human nature. So by nature here, what we mean is the essential form of something. I'm not sure if your class has covered um, anything to do with this, but so form, essence, uh, anything like this, this is an idea that traces its way back to, to Plato and Aristotle primarily. And it is essentially uh, the nature of something in this context is what kind of thing is it? What defines something as the kind of thing that it is? And so for human beings, we're defined by our rational nature, that we are rational animals. But it's important that, uh, well, we're rational animals and we're also political animals, according to Aristotle, which is another foundation of the tradition. 
Um, and so we, we do not only think, but we also think together. And then we're also animals, right? The, the specifically rational kind of animals. So we also still do all of the all of the sorts of things that other animals do, but we do those things in the specifically rational way that makes us distinctively human, right? And so if we look to um, what, uh, what essential parts of us are important for figuring out what sort of things we should do, um, we look first to what we share in common with all other beings, all things in the world. We are beings. Insofar as we exist, our end, our characteristic end, our characteristic um, talos, if you will, is to continue in being, to maintain our being. And so that's essential. That is, the, that is our starting baseline. But it's not characteristic of us enough. So we need to go up a level to, well, we share other things with living beings. There's all sorts of other creatures that are alive, that are, that are uh, things like plants and animals, all that sort of thing. And those are what we call uh, the vegetative parts of ourselves, or our vegetative powers, or our vegetative ends. Uh, and those are nutrition and reproduction. We we grow, we develop, uh, and we reproduce ourselves um, in a way of sort of developing further, that initial way of uh, of simply being, right? Rocks just sort of exist. They're there, right? But a tree is there in new different ways, right? So when a tree uh, doesn't just kind of continue existing like a rock does, it does it in its distinctively vegetative way by taking in nutrients and not just staying how it is, but developing and growing. And then it, it might drop seeds or acorns or what have you to make more things like itself, which is a way of extending its being beyond just the here and now, just the way that it right is, is right now. And then if you go up a step further, closer and closer to humanity, we have animals not just living beings, but the kind that interact with each other and interact with the world directly. Um, our animate powers, our animate ends, those we share with animals, are locomotion and sensation. We can, we can sense and interact with the world around us, and we can move around in it on our own. And so that gives us new ways of doing the things that, we, that the lower creatures, the lower things, already were. So we can continue existing by moving around, by avoiding danger, seeking out, uh, seeking out food. Um, we can sense the world around us uh, in order to find things that we need, in order to sustain our being, to continue our being, all of that. And then finally, we human beings have these two additional, very uniquely special things, which are rationality and society. So we do all of these other things that all of the other animals do. But we do them in a uniquely rational and interpersonal or social way. And so to be human, and therefore to be human well, in other words, to be a good human being, uh, is to do all of the things that are characteristic of a human being in the characteristically human way, which is to say rationally and socially. So, okay. yeah, so just questions a, on any of that. Yeah, yeah, just a quick um, question about one just like a quick summary like i'm in my head i'm thinking of like a, a concentric circle where you have vegetative on the outside and then the next ring is the anim animative or how did you say it so so being then more existential that, so just stuff yeah like stick right this yeah. is just a thing right it exists and so it is good for this thing to keep existing so that's your outermost sort of layer um yeah. and then i don't have a plotted plant in here but you get the idea Right. A layer in or a layer up, maybe if you want to think of it in sort of in hierarchical terms, you have living creatures. So those are plants and, and stuff like plants. Right? I'm deriving this from Aristotle. So he didn't have a, a, a careful distinguish between like plants and fungi, but he'd call all of them plants. So let's just go with that. Um, then a layer up from that, we have animals, which have these additional things. And so further in, closer to human beings, higher up in this level of hierarchy. And then finally, what we have at the top or in the center are human beings. Right? We have all of these other things topped off with rationality in society. Good. So on top of just understanding the way that we're different from animals, one, one animal in particular I'm thinking of is uh, would be like apes or mm -hmm. higher intelligent animals mm -hmm. that seem to have a level of rationality at mm -hmm. least from how i perceive and see those animals interacting with the world 
But I would obviously still think that I'm different from them in, in a unique way. But I still see that they have rational powers, but maybe just to a lesser degree. Like, how would you understand that distinction there? So I would distinguish it as there are within each of these layers, there's degrees. And then between yeah. each layer, there are gaps. So uh, say the great apes uh, the, and, and maybe dolphins or maybe, maybe a few other very sophisticated animals. Um, I would not say that they have less sophisticated rational powers than we do, but they have much more sophisticated uh, sensory powers than other mm-hmm. animals do. Right? So, they, so they, they do something like communicate, but they don't communicate like we do. Right? They don't share concepts with each other. They don't talk about things particularly things that aren't present, right? That aren't, uh, that are abstract. That's the mark of rationality in particular is, uh, is abstraction from the particulars of, of the lives we live, of the lives that we live. And so we can do things like, uh, like long-term planning for the future. We can conceptualize, uh, abstract objects, um, like mathematics, like groups of things, um, or groups of people even, uh, in a way that goes beyond just, you know, this troop of apes, say, or some, or this pod of dolphins, or say, that sort of thing. Uh, and so, um, while, well, even we might we might even say something like that. You can do the same thing with plants that are almost animals, right? So the so plants that that to some degree seem to almost auto locomote. How like um, how sunflowers will sort of grow and face the sun and turn throughout the day. Or how uh, how things like Venus flytraps will will snap shut in order to to capture prey that sort of thing. We, I think we would call that a an expression an advanced expression, but still an expression of their merely vegetative powers and their vegetative ends and so nutrition in both of those cases. Um, but it's getting closer to that gap between plants and animals. And similarly, yeah, things like great apes are getting closer to that gap between animals and rational animals. But there's still that jump, and there's still a difference right. in kind between the two. And, that, and that jump, and that jump is abstraction, the ability yeah. to do abstract thinking. Yeah, which is also the source of soci- of uh, of um, our social or political nature as well, right? So if we yeah. can, if we think of ourselves as a particular kind of thing, we can also think of ourselves as part of an abstract thing called a group, right? Yeah. So you watching this are part of a class, right? So you are part of this thing that doesn't exist. Right? There's no thing in the world that you can point to that is a class, right? But rather, what the class is, is a certain way that you all relate to one another, that you understand. And it's understandable in this sort of abstract way. It's, a, um, it's what you might call a gestalt property that is over and above this, the, uh, the, the particularities of any given member of the class or, uh, or anything like that. Uh, and so the capacity to understand things in this abstract, uh, rational way gives rise to both aspects of our uniquely human nature, the, the rational aspect and the political aspect. Great. Can you uh, just describe the political aspect a little bit more detail? Yeah, so this is how we relate to yeah. other human beings as human beings, and not just as other things. Right? So I'll, I'll react to my, my drink here, right, as just another thing that I happen to be using for my own purposes. I'm I'm interacting with, with say the screen, the compu- the uh, the webcam, and the microphone of my computer as things that I'm using. There are things that I I recognize as distinctly lower than me, of different of a different kind, right? I even react uh, interact with my pets, right? I have two cats, and I interact with them as different kinds of things, but I'm interacting with you in a unique way, right? In a way that is. Um, as peers we recognize each other as the same kind of thing we recognize each other as fellow human beings and so what that means is i have to treat you as um as the same kind of thing that i am and so i have to treat your ends with the same type of respect that i treat my own and so and again this this is where we get a lot of the um the 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 what you think of as the more basic, more simple precepts of natural law, like not not killing and not stealing and things like that, right? Um, why I shouldn't murder another human being, for example, is because that is another thing like myself. If I am to treat another human being in a way that disregards their nature, which is the same as my own, that is in this that is the same type of thing as me disregarding my own nature 
I'm rejecting what it is to be human in their case. And because we're rational, abstracting creatures, if I'm rejecting humanity per se in another person, that's akin to rejecting my own humanity as well. I'm, I'm diminishing myself to less than the kind of thing that I am. So in that sense, then, we are political beings. And now, again, this is maybe a terminological thing, but political, I don't mean necessarily in the sense of, like, well, um, we just got done with an election. That's not the kind of thing I'm talking about, right? Right. Um, I'm not talking about legislation or governance or anything like that. I'm talking about, and Aristotle was talking about, um, we live together in societies, in groups of human beings that we that we create and that we organize and that we we live together with. That's what we mean. That's what we mean. Uh, the natural law tradition means by by political, in that sense. Yeah. Right. So what we normally mean by political, like in just common everyday speech, is like a manifestation of us as political beings right yeah um it's a yeah. it's a particular a particular type of manifestation of us as political yeah. beings right because as yeah. as political beings we do all sorts of things other than what we think of as politics right in politics in the modern sense we also do we also do economics right there is yeah. the there's the kind of i don't know i think of it as half joking i'm not sure if the, the people who use this term are actually serious I'm not sure, but uh, there's the term that comes up of uh, describing human beings as homo economicus, right? The economic animal, um, having to do because we do things like exchange goods, we create things, we trade with one another. But that that's just a really specific application of being a political animal, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 much broader than than we tend to think of. At least that's what um, that's what Aristotle and uh, and a lot of the classical Aristotelians um, that's what they meant when they said political animal. It encompasses all of these social factors that bring us together as human beings. Great. So the next step then, now that we understand that humans are the kind of thing that they are, mm -hmm. the natural law um, view says that whatever morality is, is uniquely and specially tied to that feature of us that distinguishes mm -hmm. us from everything else. Right. And so one right. thing about this, another another maybe thought experiment that can help help grasp that. Um we 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 the sort of natural law tradition would say that um moral norms or ethical norms supervene on uh metaphysical uh natures, let's say. So what something is determines what is the right way it should act and how and the right way we should interact with it if so there are other traditions that think that it would be sort of logically possible for moral norms to be different but the kind of creatures we are to remain the same right? anything that is uh, any kind of anything that um of any sort of positivism We'll say we'll say basically this sort of thing. Um, divine command theory is distinguished from natural law theory in precisely this way. Um, uh, sort of more positivistic natural law, or uh, um, or not natural law, a um, divine command theory. We'll say that God could have created the world and declared that, say, adultery is permissible, or um, murder is acceptable of certain people groups, or something like that. That God could have commanded differently, um, or we might think that. You know, we could, uh, in say maybe a um, uh, Rawlsian, uh, Rawlsian sort of democratic kind of um, um, kind of approach, we could come up with different moral ideals that would be universally acceptable, and so uh, and so they would simply be different norms that we would be able to obey without us changing in a fundamental way. Natural law theory doesn't think that. Natural law would say that for there to be a substantial change in ethics. In ethical norms, there would have to be a substantial change in the kind of things that we are. Right? So theoretically, it's entirely possible for um, for their uh, for morality to have been substantially different. But we would have had to have been different kinds of creatures, and we would have had to have lived in a different kind of world. So take murder for example. Right? It's entirely possible that we could be we could have been different kinds of creatures. Right, human beings could be different in fundamental ways that would mean that murder could be permissible, right? <clears throat> the reason murder is intrinsically wrong for human beings 
is because it kills us, right? It uh, it destroys that essential nature that makes us what us what we are. And so to do that to each other is this sort of disregard for our fundamental nature. But if we were in some sense immortal, right? If we if if when you killed a person they didn't stay dead, right? If we respawned like in a video game or something like that, murder wouldn't be intrinsically wrong anymore, because killing someone is not this permanent destruction of their human essence. Now, it might still be wrong for other reasons, right? It still might be, um, it still might be assault, basically. You're, you're, you're doing something to somebody involuntarily, right? That, that sort of thing. But it wouldn't be the same kind of wrong that we have now. And so all of the moral norms uh, put forward by natural law theory work in this way. You have to look at what kind of thing something is. And then from that, we can directly derive how we ought to behave based on what kind of thing we are and what kinds of things we're interacting with. And if we're acting, we were, if we were completely different kinds of creatures, then yeah, of course the norms would be different. And so natural law is, is uh, thought of specifically as an application of the universal law or the eternal law of how the cosmos works applied specifically to human beings. Good. So we've established the, the metaphysical component, right? The kind of thing that we are determines mm -hmm. the kind of thing that we ought to be. So let's let's take it one level further. What about the uh, epistemological dimension? How do we know that this is the kind of thing that we are, and this is the kind of way that we ought to to live? Especially given the reality that other cultures seem to be different, and other people seem to be different in the sorts of moral values and moral goods that they uh, seek to live their life for. Right, and there's a few answers to this. Right. <clears throat> uh, one potential answer is that there are sufficient environmental differences to make it that the norms would vary from place to place, from context to context, from culture to culture. Right. Um, now, those differences would could not be extreme. There would still be some fundamental moral principles that would, would be invariable because we're still human beings. But remember that we are human beings interacting with, a, with the world in particular ways because the world is the way that it is. Right. And so natural law might vary depending upon our particular social context. Like for example, um, as a student, you have particular obligations that you've taken on as part of that social role. And those, those are just as much a part of the natural law. They're just more precisely applicable to your circumstances, right? Y you might have an obligation to turn in an assignment that you know your friend who's not in that class with you does not have. And that obligation is, is just as real, maybe not quite as morally significant, but just as real as uh, any other obligation under natural law, right? Your, your obligation to treat other people fairly, to, uh, uh, to treat other people as human beings, right? all of these. Now, okay, maybe that doesn't get you all the way, right? That only gets minor differences. There are still essential things about humanity, like don't murder, um, the the the... Uh, the the generally speaking to to be virtuous, you can be, you can basically follow the um, stick with the cardinal virtues. Those still those still count for natural law. Right? Um, acting justly is still acting justly, regardless of uh, the specific application of it. Okay, so then we get into the the epistemological question of well, how do we figure out what kinds of creatures we are, and how do we know what that entails? Well, a lot of that is what we would probably think of as more scientific today. Um, but with what the uh, what the scholastics would think would call natural philosophy, right? or what we might call something like the philosophy of science. So we have to look at what kinds of creatures we are, both uh, both biologically, right, because we're animals, um, existentially, so like physically, right? that that matters as well, uh, and then further uh, psychologically, right, that that we have to work in a certain way that's observable from observing the kinds of creatures we are. And so the epistemology of the matter involves more than just um, theoretical uh, philosophical speculation. Uh, so for example, uh, natural law has, uh, is uh, I guess maybe almost infamous for, um, for particularly complex and rigid, uh, we would think today as rigid um, sexual ethic, right? That, uh, that the proper context for human sexuality is uh, is lifelong marriage for uh, for the um, union of the spouses and and procreation of children. Right? Okay, we have to look to why that would be the case, 
And to figure out why that would be the case, we have to figure out, like, what are we? And how do we live? And how do we live with each other? And how do we come to be? Right. So, so human children, right, we, we sort of learn this by studying both at a, at a sort of less scientific level of just sort of observing human, beha human behavior and human development. But then even more scientifically, we can look to, to the, the physiological aspects of it, the biological aspects of it, the, um, the childhood development. Um, and we can find that uh, human beings um, not only are born rather vulnerable, right? uniquely, almost uniquely vulnerable in the animal kingdom, um, but also require far more parental development, right? And so because we require this, this extensive parental development, um, that means that we are, uh, the, the parents of human children are almost uniquely bound to one another for the sake of raising, of raising those children. Now, what does that have to do with sexuality? Well, because we can look to the particular ends of not just us as humans in general, but we can look to the particular ends of the certain things that we do, the natural ends of, well, that, that sexual faculty that we have is for making new human beings. And so that needs to be ordered to this bigger picture of this long process of having and raising children. And that that gives us a reason for thinking that we that that doing that thing that produces children, the appropriate context for doing that is one in which uh, one in which the having and then more importantly the raising in a society of those children uh, is uh, is practically taken care of, right? Such that when parents are going to raise children, that the, uh, the act of sex that, that gives rise to those children not only does that, but it also binds them together in some sense, such that they are, and again, we can look at this psychologically and, chem and uh, you know, physiochemically and such, but it binds them together, uh, both psychologically and practically, um, such that they, they are now parents together to raise this new child. And so in that course, that also does a few other things. It unites them socially speaking, right? As this is now a little family unit, right? That these two human beings have produced a third. And by uniting that as a little family unit, that also brings them together, socially speaking, as a unit. And so they will, they will um, say, uh, doing this not lewdly, um, they will be incentivized to create more of those, those little human beings, let's say. Uh, and so that, that duration, that somewhere between, you know, 15 and 25 years of raising that child gets extended out and extended out and extended out. And that suddenly becomes the vast majority of a human being's adult life. And so we, from right here, just from looking at what we can simply observe in some cases and what we can study in other cases, we've derived what would otherwise be a relatively controversial view about, at least controversial today, uh, about sexual ethics, we've derived simply from looking at, okay, what are human beings? How do we reproduce ourselves? Uh, and how does that, um, what does that tell us about how we should behave in ways that have to do with that act of reproduction? And so you can apply that to just about anything too. You can apply that to, um, to you can apply that to, you know, why shouldn't we kill each other? Well, because we're mortal and because we're the same sort of things and we'll, you can do the whole thing. Um, you can apply that to food, right? You can apply that to why gluttony is wrong. Um, and you can look to things like uh, modern nutritional science will tell us roughly the same sort of thing, but in more detail um, as, uh, as you know, ancient virtue theories having to do with, uh, with uh, moderation with respect, to, uh, with respect to food intake and that sort of thing. Good. So one last um, thing to push back on just to mm -hmm. get more clarification. So uh, take a, a culture that that views, say, human sacrifice as a necessary component of the way that they worship their god, mm -hmm. or um, like some form of cannibalistic society, a society that thinks it's morally correct to eat other humans. How would how would someone who how how would you like go about? Um, explaining how yes there may be differences but there are some fundamentally true things across the board when we observe human beings how would you mm -hmm. explain like extreme cases like that yeah so i mean the the short maybe too short answer 
is uh, that they've got the metaphysics wrong, right? And if that's the case, if it is the case that uh, that um, that they don't have that there aren't really gods worthy of worship that are demanding uh, human cannibalistic sacrifices, say, or, or what have you, um, then the metaphysics don't line up. But maybe that's too simple, right? And or maybe that involves uh, involves far too much uh, philosophy of religion rather than ethics, and we're doing this thing over here and not this other thing over here. So okay, there is a case to be made for some instances of let's say violation of what we would ordinarily think of as our um, our uh, our ethical norms, our natural our, our natures for the sake of something higher, right? So we, um, especially in terms of sacrifice, right? In terms of sacrifice um, in a religious sense, but even even in a sort of um, interpersonal social sense, right? So we um, we might be perfectly willing to sacrifice, um, like we even, like Christians today, are perfectly willing to sacrifice our time and treasure, say, to help the less fortunate for the sake of God. We might be willing to, say, fast and abstain from genuine goods, which goes against the virtue of temperance, right? Straightforwardly, right? So if you if you fast for a day, say, or you fast for a week, say, that is in some sense, in some really significant sense, contrary to the natural ends, the natural human ends of nutrition, right? Of, of taking in nutrients and sustaining the body. Your body's going to take some damage from that. But you can make an argument that if that damage is, um, particularly if the damage is temporary, particularly if the damage is manageable, but even if not, that it's that it is um, a sacrifice of oneself for a higher purpose. And right? so self-sacrifice can still can still work in this sense because part of our part of our human ends, if we are correct on the metaphysics there, is something like ultimate union with the divine, whatever whatever form that actually takes. And and the the correct answer to those questions is really important for this, so I'm kind of glazing over a lot of it. But um, but if they're correct, if, right? These, if these, um, if whatever culture we're we're hypothetically talking about is correct, that um, that there is uh, that there are there is something divine which uh, requires of us something like human sacrifice or something like that. Um, it may be a problem in involuntary cases still, right? Because that is that is a. That would be something like a disregarding of some other very important uh, capacity of humanity, which is our which is our will, uh, thought of as part of our uh, part of our intellectual uh, rational nature. But something like um, voluntary human sacrifice, if the metaphysics were correct, I, I don't necessarily think uh, that would be automatically ruled out by natural law. Now, I think it probably would be. I think it would probably be a good hint that that's incorrect. Uh, that'd yeah. be a good reason to further investigate whether that is actually correct metaphysically. Um, but if it turned out to be correct, and you could, and you had, you know, moral certainty that that uh, you got the metaphysics right, you got the you got the theology right. Um, I don't know if natural law would necessarily rule it out. It would advise caution, obviously, but I don't know if it would necessarily rule it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, given, given, I feel what... like there might have been more of that. Oh well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of go in deeper yeah. with this okay. too um so i think it's I th one of the points i just made to the class um uh, very recently is that there's like an impulse that we have as humans to to be cautious about the way in which we um evaluate cultural norms mm -hmm. right and that's just the way that i, I think it's a good thing Right, you don't want a, a Christian missionary going into a society that thinks that polygamy is like the correct way to to live their life, who thinks that it's an actually economically advantageous thing to do, and the missionary saying you need to divorce all your mm -hmm. vows but one. To them, it's going to mean so so living for Jesus equals poverty. Mm -hmm. Like you want me to to starve, <laughs> basically. So. I say all that because I think that the advantage of natural law in this context is it requires us to understand more what they're saying about their moral values. Mm -hmm. And it could be the case that they're still valuing human life. They just don't think that other humans are identical to them in terms of being the same kind of thing that 
mm -hmm. that we are to them. Yeah. Right. And if they may be getting that wrong, but they're still acting in a way where they they do think that they're preserving human life and caring about human life. I mean, to be fair, Christians have gotten that wrong as well, historically, at least. Yeah. Right. Um, there was there was a, an intense period of debate um, in the sort of age of discovery, the, the late 14th, 15th centuries uh, as to whether the uh, the natives of the Americas were children of Adam. And if they're not, then who cares? There, there's some. Other, if there's some other creature, that mean that might mean we need to develop separate norms for a separate kind of possibly yeah, right. rational, but possibly not bearing the image and likeness of God set of creatures or people or whatever they are. Um, and so, if we if we if we can't come to that conclusion, if we if we come to a conclusion like that, I should say, if we if we are like these separate sorts of things, then those same principles don't necessarily apply. Now, I I, I again, I think that. I mean, we, we've resolved this issue, right? I think that um, since then, we've, we've kind of figured out that, no, we're the same sorts of things. Right? We all are human beings. We're all uh, this particular sort of, uh, of importantly similar, right? Uh, rational animals sharing the same sort of nature. Um, and by we, I just mean Christendom, broadly speaking. Um, and, yeah. and realistically, I would probably say most human societies have more or less figured this out. Um, and I, I say that with some caveats because we still screw it up sometimes. Um, but um, I think that I think that having a kind of humble approach and and so one of the things that I'm always I always I'm, I always caution my students about is to make sure that you're taking any kind of ethical analysis one step at a time, and that involves figuring out precisely why someone has come to a particular ethical or moral conclusion about something because if you do that if you if you walk through it step by step if there is a problem you can see exactly where the problem is and then you can actually communicate about the matter right and so if we if what we have is say um if say to use your example if a, a christian missionary comes upon a polygamous culture now polygamy is contrary to the natural law at least in uh, at least in significant in some significant respects um, but perhaps there is something like a concession for in maybe in the short term, whatever, there might be a concession for, um, for say economic circumstances, or something like that, which wouldn't necessarily make it right, but might make it under, uh, certainly understandable and figuring out what leads a society to a particular, not even just a society, but particular individuals to a particular moral conclusion allows you to sort of meet them where they're at and have an, have a, uh, a genuine intellectual discussion about, um, about the question, the, the disagreements we might have, um, where the disagreement actually lies instead of just miles down the road at the conclusion, right? Because at the conclusion, we might say something like, no, um, one man, one woman for life. That's what marriage is. And even though that might be correct, right? Even though we might've gotten every step of the process correct, we don't know where the divergence happened. And so we don't, and, and so if we're just going to come at them with just like, here's the conclusion done, you're right. They're just going to say, well, no, I just disagree with you. I think, I think you're wrong entirely and because here's how we do things. And it seems to be working just fine. But whereas if we, if we carefully communicate and we carefully dialogue and we try, we carefully deliberate together and figure out exactly where we, where we separate at that point of separation, we're still very close to each other. And so it's much easier to figure out how to reconcile that difference to say, well, you've gone, you've taken this turn where I've taken this turn. And I still think that this, this is the correct turn to take, but you can examine as to why this turn rather than that one. And if you can, at that point, if you're correct, right? Because we all, I think we all presume that we're correct, right? I think it's a rational thing to assume that you're probably correct until you figure out a really good reason for thinking otherwise. Um, if you are right, and they've taken the wrong turn there. When the differences are so small, it's much easier to say, well, here's, here's why I think this is the right turn. And then maybe at some point they're going to say, okay, well, then after that line of process, that process of thought, I would maybe diverge again here. There might be another difference. And then we can figure that out. This is a really long, difficult process and a very, very intellectual process that, that often requires a long time. And it often requires... Um, in some cases, like generational change, right? 
because it can be really difficult to change to change fundamental aspects about how you're living as well. Uh, even if you ultimately should, and even if you even if you acknowledge that you ultimately should make significant changes to how you how you live, um, it can be excessively hard to do so, and <clears throat> it might be understandable and even um, even mitigating in some sense. It might even mitigate responsibility or culpability. Uh, the reasons you might have for for say having made a um, an error in your moral calculations uh, it might mitigate responsibility for that error to um be sort of locked into a circumstance where we're altering your behavior at this point would be disastrous right so so yeah i do think that um this this process of examination that, that we call natural law analysis uh, i think it really can help with with these kinds of discussions by by zeroing in very carefully onto where the disagreement lies and why yeah. there is this difference. Yeah, good. So um, I want to get into some objections, but first I want to summarize. Mm -hmm. Okay. It seems like what what you're saying here is that if if we correctly define natural law and understand it um, well, it has all of the resources within itself to navigate the moral landscape in an effective and and powerful way mm -hmm. would you say that that's right yeah yeah so that the we get the and specifically and what what makes natural law unique is we get those resources from observations of the way things are yeah so it's 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 empirical our yeah. our endeavor using natural law analysis allows us to not only understand what our end should be what goals and values we should aim for, but also how to relate to other humans well in a way where we can work toward that end, mm -hmm. even if they're in the midst of significant disagreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything I would add to caveat that, but no, I think that's about right. Yeah, that's a good description, I think. Good. So let's just, let's go on to a couple objections and mm -hmm. You know, I, I uh, neglected to look at what time we started, so um, I, I don't want to be too... We are 42 minutes in. Okay, so we've got about, got about 18 or so minutes. So um, there's two main things that I really wanted... Well, I, maybe you could say three. Um, one is how does natural law relate to uh, Christianity? Mm -hmm. um, Two, how does natural law relate to virtue ethics, right? The idea of um, becoming the, the right kind of person, not just doing correct moral actions that are aimed toward a, a good end, but becoming the kind of person where that's the disposition we have to act in any given circumstance that we're in. Um, and then how, so Christianity, how does it relate to Christianity? How does it relate to the understanding of virtue, the concept of virtue? And then, of course, I think the final thing I'd want to talk about is um, the is ought problem, and I'll just say that as like a, a trailer, yeah, uh, and then I'll let you describe it later. So okay, sounds um, good. So tackle so each one in order. Um, natural law theory <clears throat> is pretty closely tied with the historical Christian tradition, not entirely. Uh, it did arise before Christianity did. It, it you can trace it back to to um, Plato and Aristotle in different parts of what they're saying. And so this also, this also will relate to talking about virtue. So keep that in mind, I guess. Um, but in terms of uh, in terms of Christianity and Christian ethics, it isn't the only school of ethical thought that's common among Christians. Uh, I mentioned before divine command theory, which is a radically different approach to ethics, um, but it's still common within Christianity, and it has a, an historical pedigree, um, not quite as long, but almost as long. And so. Um, it is closely tied with Christianity. Now, that said. Um, natural law theory, I don't think, strictly speaking, relies upon um, theological premises uh, in a way that divine command theory might. Right? I don't think that you need to hold to um, specifically Christian uh, or even really theistic um, metaphysics or, or theology uh, in order to come to natural law conclusions. I do think it helps, though. Um, I think it helps, but only in the same sense that I think that, so I think natural law ethics kind of relies on, on good theology, but only in the same way that metaphysics, I think also relies on good theology. If you, if you get the, if you get the, the theology wrong, 
then you're gonna have a harder time figuring out what the world is like if you don't have if you don't start with this idea that the world is created by god um then you're gonna have a hard time explaining explaining things like natures like essences like teloi like ends um because in most um certainly in most atheistic systems but even in a lot of uh of just sort of non non monotheistic systems uh there's a harder time g both grasping the concept of and grounding the concepts uh of uh, say final cause of, of the purposes in innate purposes in things or innate natures types of things and so what we're often reduced to is efficient and material cause right, in aristotelian terms the idea that that the only things that are true about things is uh is causal is uh sort of push-pull causal relationships and uh and uh material relations between physical things right? and so if you're a reductive materialist sure it's kind of hard to get natural law off the ground. But it's also hard to get, you know, metaphysics off the ground. It's kind of hard to describe what things are, right? What a human being is. And causal relationships between things get kind of wonky. So uh, so I do think that that natural law theory, I think, kind of depends upon Christianity in a loose sense. But only insofar as anything else does. Um, I, I just think that Christianity is true. And so figuring that out is a good first step to uh to yeah. working through philosophy <clears throat> beyond that though i don't think that it's uniquely christian in any uh, in any really robust sense um like the like the theological virtues might be or like uh or like um uh, various salvation theories might be or anything like that yeah um, and uh um, w would you say like even if it's not uniquely christian in the way that you just described this theory if i'm not mistaken was basically developed by christians first right in the way more or, less. or no it, it was developed or, into okay. into the form we think of it as today by christians it, gotcha. like i said though it has its roots uh deep into the socratics so into plato and aristotle and the, and the early platonists the platonists okay. more than the aristotelians i would say um it only picked up Aristotelian characteristics much later in the tradition, um, during the sort of late medieval period, the high middle ages with Thomas Aquinas, the sort of rediscovery of Aristotle's primary texts, where we brought that theory in and combined it with the sort of Christian Neoplatonism that developed in like through Augustine. It's a it's a big synthesis. The way we, the form that we find natural law in, um, up into the modern period to today. Um is essentially the synthesis of ancient classical Greek ideas with uh, with early Christian ideas. Uh, it is to to use the um, the Tertullian phrase. Uh, it's um, a sort of synthesis of Athens and Jerusalem in that sense. Um, but yeah. the roots go go very deep. I would say even even older than Christianity. Good. Good. So one last question related to that then. Um... Virtue theory next. Oh, oh, yeah. We'll do virtue theory, okay, okay. but just on the Christian okay. relationship to natural law, really quick. Um, one of the ways that I understand, like, if I were to look at the building blocks of a Christian worldview, the way I always describe it is like, you, your doctrine of God is always the starting point. God is God, right? That's mm -hmm. the most fundamental theological commitment that you have <laughs> and the scholastics and, held theology to be the queen of the sciences meaning that it's the fundamental yeah. basis that you have to get right before you can get to ontology and then metaphysics and then ethics and then yes. all the others yes yeah, so we're, we're both we're both tracking on that idea and so when i think of like what is a human being i'm not just thinking what am i in terms of a an earthly creature and an earthly creature in a particular special relationship with other humans and with this power of thinking abstractly i'm also thinking of it in terms of i am a kind of thing that relates to god in a uniquely kind of way and that should determine how i think about what i ought to do yeah right yeah so and do you um, think natural law requires that we have a correct understanding of god as part of that process of understanding the kind of thing that we are i think so but again i think only in the sense that a correct understanding of God is also kind of required to get metaphysics right too, right? Yeah. Because if you don't understand the world is created and that the world is created and sustained in being by uh, by a loving God and that that things have their essences intrinsically to themselves as as they were created in certain ways and all, all that stuff, um, 
you start getting metaphysics wrong. Uh, in the same way, it, you're right. If you don't have this conception of, of human beings as <clears throat> um, as bearing the image and likeness of God, having this having this infinite moral weight, um, being part of not only political communities in the Aristotelian sense, but as part of an ecclesiastical community, as part of the church, as part of this this mystical union, the body of Christ, all of that. Um, as uh, in addition, thinking of uh, our ultimate human end, not as uh, worldly eudaimonia, uh, like Aristotle would have it, uh, but as uh, eternal union with God, uh, and uh, and uh, a, a kind of sanctification. If you get any of that wrong, then you're going to be missing crucial aspects of natural law theory as well. I think because uh, those do come into play. I've been I've been um, I've been going from the ground up, right? Uh, and so I've been going from the more from the more <clears throat> sort of this worldly and naturalistic. Um, which is pretty traditional in terms of natural law. That's what Aquinas did even. But um, grace perfects nature. It doesn't supplant yeah. it. But it does so last, right? It does, it does the whole thing. It, it, grace perfects nature in, in a similar way to how rationality elevates the human, the human person above mere animal. Grace elevates the human person above mere, uh, mere mortality, more humanity, mere humanity. Uh, we become we become uh, something again yet higher, yeah, right. Yeah. And so, so it does it has that similar effect, right? Um, but you've still got to work from the ground up in order to figure things out. And so, so you figure yeah, out right. the, the yeah. theological aspects, uh, kind of last, but then how it transforms the whole thing. And to figure out how it transforms the whole thing, you have to have a grasp of the whole thing too. Yeah, so it's it's an interesting predicament because we'd say them like the ultimate foundation of reality is god mm -hmm. he's not only the creator but also the sustainer mm -hmm. but the way that we come to know that that's true is we start with with the particulars mm -hmm. the things that we know from experience and the things that we know as mediated through god's communication through his word it's very um, aristotelian yeah, yeah it's the, a very the, interesting the, the order of ontology yeah. is the reverse of the order of uh of epistemology um, yeah i mean that's just the kind of situation that we're in as humans how we discover these sorts of things yeah um yeah good so let's move on to virtue ethics then mm -hmm. all right so there's also a relationship I, i've been mentioning aristotle a lot like it's it's hard not to when you're talking about uh natural law theory uh it's hard not to when you're talking about aquinas um it's hard not to when you're doing philosophy frankly um but <clears throat> uh there is this connection uh with virtue theory to the point where it only really, natural law and virtue theory only really develop as these sort of separate moral theories rather than two aspects of the same thing um, in the distinctively modern period of the like 19th, 20th centuries. When so normally it a, wasn't thought of as different things, uh, not but then medieval. it became thought of as different things? Is that not what you're saying? Not by the medievals, no. Okay. Um, they only became thought of as different things once we started to sort of multiply these weird little moral theories that we have. Um, yeah. Uh, Alistair McIntyre was a, uh, is, I should say, he's still alive. He's like 95 or 96 now. Um, oh. uh, he's still like actively working. So he's really <laughs> impressive in that way. Um, yeah. We wrote a book in 1984, maybe, uh, called After Virtue. And he's a virtue theorist, primarily. But he's also, um, his major contribution, I think, to the sort of development of philosophical thought is the point that our our conception of ethics is too disjointed, right? That we think of ethics as this moral theory or that moral theory or this other moral theory, um, rather than thinking of it as as a sort of holistic approach to uh, figuring out what the right thing to do is and doing that on the basis of uh, well of what and he wants to try and figure out what uh, and he takes the the Aristotelian virtue approach. But in so doing, he talks about all the sorts of things that, that natural law theorists will talk about, right? About human nature and that part of human nature is to be virtuous in these ways. And that what, the, what virtue is in that sense is the, is the perfection or fulfillment of the essential human nature. And so the, the development of virtue is done by doing, uh, doing repeatedly good actions such that they become a sort of second nature. And so all of these sort of, they flow together in a lot of ways. Um, I, I don't think you can really have one without the other, right? I don't think that you can have um, natural law theory with no concept of virtue, 
um, because virtue is, like I said, just for sort of description of um, what a human being looks like when we're functioning well. And vices just are a description of ways that we can go wrong, right? Um, habit, bad habits that we can get into, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but then similarly, I think that virtues have to be described and defined in terms of human nature, right? And so, because what is justice but treating things according to their due? And, excuse me, what is due to other human beings other than treating them as they, as they are, as they ought to be? And that, that involves uh, a sort of discovery of their the fundamental essential nature and this this you can apply this to any of the virtues as well um justice is usually the clearest example though um all right so, so again i think that um the two flow together um very very well and that the this this separation between them and quite frankly even the separation between um natural law uh, virtue theory and even the other sort of major schools of thought uh, are are largely artificial um it it's a matter of let me put it this way. Uh, classical natural law theorists would think of it more as a difference in emphasis uh, or methodology in investigation rather than a fundamental difference in theory in, in theoretical approach. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that is one of the disadvantages of, of teaching it um, in a way where you help students understand mm -hmm. that these are different theories that people have had. And you want to you want to be true to how things have developed, but you also want to recognize that there's a reason why these things develop that way and natural law theory i think rightly criticizes the modern enlightenment thinking in terms of the ways in which it kind of disjointed mm -hmm. um well moral theories in a certain way yes but i think it only really does it indirectly yeah by that i mean it really only does it only criticizes these uh, the sort of modern um fracturing of moral theories by presenting a more holistic uh classical yeah. alternative right um when you when you see the statue whole it's it's hard not to see the cracks in the one that's broken you know yeah yeah good well uh the last thing i want to talk about is the probably one of i i'm actually not familiar how big of an objection people make it but oh, probably one the of the biggest one. objections yeah okay yeah. the biggest objection to natural law theory is what's called the is ought problem. Go ahead and yeah. explain that for us. Uh, so the is ought problem, or what's also known as the naturalistic fallacy. Um, this is uh, if people reject or natural fact law theory, value dichotomy. Is that another way of other talking way of saying, about yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the, so two of those names we get from David Hume: uh, the fact value dichotomy, and the is ought, uh, the is ought gap. Um, the naturalistic fallacy, I think, I think. Don't quote me on this. I could be wrong. I think it comes from John Stuart Mill. Um, but again, I could be off on that. Uh, it's outside my period of study, so forgive me. Um, in any case, these are these are more or less sort of three names for the same uh, the same uh, problem that I would I would really just call a pseudo problem. It, it appears to be a problem, but it's um, I think it largely comes from a misunderstanding of um, the metaphysics involved. Right? Okay, so if people reject natural law theory, it's usually for two reasons, one of two reasons, or both. One is this this problem um the other is the accusation of motivated reasoning right you want to start we want to come to certain conclusions this allows you to come to those conclusions i disagree with those conclusions and so i'm going to take a different approach which is uh, i don't like that method of arguing i don't think it's it's not typically all that well respected yeah. philosophically but but it comes up this one is the is the primary academically reputable and respected objection to natural law theory so it's the big one uh, and it goes something like this that what we observe in the world are facts, the way that things are. Even if we can observe and determine what natures, uh, what natures there are, the, 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 na the natures of things, the essences of what makes a thing what it is, that you can't derive an ought statement, in other words, what ought to be done, from simple is statements. You can't derive a, uh, an imperative claim, a normative claim, from merely descriptive uh, descriptive explanations, right? In other words, what something is does not give us any particular hint to how something ought to be, uh, how something ought to be done, or how something ought to be, or how something ought to be treated, or what have you. Um, the, the reason for this is that David Hume said so. Um, I'm being a little bit tongue-in-cheek here, but um, Hume's primary argument for this is that 
he could not come up with a solid deductive reason for connecting these two things. Um, which if, if you're taking that as a sufficient argument, then that is, that is true as far as it goes, right? There isn't a deductive solid logical link, um, between observ observable facts about things and how they ought to be treated. However, um, there is a link that we can, that we can draw our attention to. So how the, how the natural law theorist, uh, at least the sort of classical natural law theorist will respond to this, uh, is by, uh, by pointing out that this objection doesn't actually ever come up in practice. Right, so the, the primary way of responding to this is by, uh, by pointing out how it is that you actually interact with things. Right, so, okay, I have, I have a couple of different liquids here. Okay, take for example, uh, I have a small glass of scotch whiskey. I have a small bottle of blue ink. Which of these should I drink? I mean, the answer, the answer is obvious, right? It kind of answers itself, right? This one is a beverage and the, the bottle of ink would not do what a beverage is supposed to do. Ah, supposed to do? It seems that we have leapt from is to ought, right? From a mere description of uh, the facts of the matter that uh, drinking this will very slightly hydrate me and, and you know, um, give me that nice warm feeling of, uh, of a nice peaty scotch whiskey, uh, whereas drinking this will make me severely ill, right? Um, from that, the, the Humean will say, uh, will, will point out that, well, that doesn't actually tell us anything about what we ought to do, how we ought to interact with these things. Um, the sensible person will say, yes, it does. To put this in maybe Kantian terms, um, there is a difficulty going from, and this is the problem that Kant put a lot of work into trying to solve, there's a difficulty going from what he calls the hypothetical imperative to the categorical imperative. So hypothetical imperatives, uh, just presumably as review, uh, if you want this, you should do that. The categorical imperatives is no matter what you want, you should do that, right? And well, yeah, I think that, that, that uh, that's a really hard gap to bridge and Kant puts in a lot of work to get across that. I don't think we need that much work to do it because what we have is for natural law. We have a whole set of hypothetical imperatives, but the antecedent, the if statements are all trivially true. Right? Because all of the if statements in natural law, all of the if, ifs of the if thens, all of those are the same thing. If you want to be a human being, then act like one in all of these various ways. And the mere fact that you are a human being is enough to, to affirm all of those antecedents. And so what we get is just the consequences as norms, right? If I want to flourish as a human being, it would be preferable for me to drink scotch whiskey over, over you know, blue ink, right? <clears throat> And so by doing this, right, what I'm doing is I'm fulfilling a particular um, hypothetical imperative right? because this is the kind of thing that is um, healthy-ish um, for a human being to drink uh, as, as radically opposed to you know, something that is not a beverage, not food, not, not edible uh, or not potable, I guess. Um, the difference we have there is that um, our if statement, our, our, um, our hypothetical is if I am the creature that I am, which I trivially am, then I should do this. So we can just shorten that to just, you know, I should do that. Right. <clears throat> so that's one, one part of this, right. One part of this explanation as to, as to how we sort of bridge this gap, because the gap is, um, it, it it's significant in one sense. Because deriving sort of universal, um, universal value claims uh, from mere factual descriptions that are they're, they're value free, um, yeah, that doesn't quite work. Um, another analogy, maybe um, economics. Economic science des describes itself as vert free, right? um, uh, value free, and what that means allegedly is that all economics does, right? Economic science 
all it does is tells you uh, what will happen economically as a result of this or that thing that we do in terms of like economic interaction, right? If you <clears throat> raise uh, this level of tariff, then trade will do this, like international trade will change in these ways. Okay, um, but it also tells you things that will be like, if you change this policy, then it'll lead to catastrophic economic disaster. Now, we can sort of wave our hands and pretend that is not a prescriptive statement of don't implement that policy, but no one actually believes that. Everyone believes that the economist is saying, hey, no, don't do this. It will cause disaster. None of them are just saying flatly in a merely factual way, hey, if we do this, it'll cause horrible disasters. Mm. Right? That, that's not what's going on. Um, uh, Ralph McInerney, a uh, 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 Thomistic philosopher who, uh, who was a sort of student of Alistair McIntyre, in fact, um, <clears throat> describes it in another really similar way. That essentially, the, the fact-value dichotomy, right? this, this is-ought gap, is supposed to be the trouble or the difficulty of getting us to go from mere observation of things to making moral ethical decisions. But he points out that we're always already making ethical decisions, right? When I decide to do something, implicit in that decision is the, the intellectual claim that what I am doing is the best thing for me to do. If it weren't, if I didn't think that, if I didn't think that what I am choosing to do is the right thing to do, I would do otherwise. Because part of choosing is choosing what we take to be a, right, what we, what we take to be a good decision. Right? And so what ethics is, is just refining and reforming the decisions that we're already making, because we're already pursuing the good, right? simply by choosing it all. And since we're already pursuing the good, ethics, in the natural law sense, is making sure that we're really doing that. Right? We're, we're pursuing real goods and not just things that seem good. Right? <clears throat> because, again, for, for somebody like Hume, if you found out that something you thought was good was not actually good. It was not worth pursuing. It would be reasonable in some weird sense to just keep doing it. But I don't think that that's actually the way that we, uh, we experience life. The way we experience life is uh, constantly, with every decision we make, trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. And so the natural law theorist will, will just sort of lay out, here are some guidelines for figuring out what the right thing to do is with respect to what you are, which is already what you're judging based on, and what things are, which is what you're trying to find out by trying to figure out how to interact with them. So it lines up perfectly with the way that we already act, we already choose, we make decisions in this way. And so even if there isn't this, uh, this carefully laid out, logically deductive connection between the way things are and the way things should be, we already make that connection by acting. And because we're already assuming that there is that connection by acting, there's no way to act otherwise. Right? You can't just not act, or you can't just ignore what you take to be the right thing to do. You're going to act. And if you think the right thing to do is nothing at all, you're going to choose to do nothing at all because you think it's the best thing to do. So I, again, I think the problem evaporates once you actually look at how we choose to yeah. act and how we're already acting. Yeah, well, there's only one other thing I wanted to say and and what you said about what kind of Hume demands in terms of like what what his terms are for accepting how you can bridge the gap, right? Mm -hmm. It's narrowly defined as whether you can provide a strong reasonable deductive argument. And I wanted Basically, to bring this that's up That's not his words, but I I don't want to I don't want to <clears throat> Oh, I guess the way that you summarized it, yeah. maybe Hume would think differently. He, um, he would, um, his argument is a bit more sophisticated than that, but that is the general gist, I think. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we went over when we, we were in epistemology uh, with, is skepticism, radical skepticism. And we mm. went over one of the skeptical arguments, basically the, you know, the brain in the vat or the CB demon, mm. whatever one you choose. Um, and one of the conclusions I made in class was somehow we're treating reason, which I would say is one of the many different ways that we come to know the world, right? We have introspection, intuition, we have the testimony of other people, we have our own memories, we have perception, right? We, and reason is one of them. Mm -hmm. 
somehow we're treating reason as if it's the only one that matters when it comes to gaining justification about our beliefs. And I think from an epistemological sense, one level of criticism against the isot problem is to say you're like narrow people are narrowly defining how to solve this problem as the kind of thing that can only be solved by this particular aspect of our source of our sources of justification when in reality we have all these other ones and natural law theory as far as i can tell draws upon things like intuition mm -hmm. and sets perception and those are all relevant and necessary features of being able to bridge that that gap mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and i think <clears throat> i think that the the sort of not to get too McIntyre here, but um, I think that that modern, the modern turn that did just sort of disassemble and then ultimately discard the what we would call the, the medieval synthesis, uh, this this scholastic, broadly speaking, scholastic neo Aristotelian and Platonic sort of amalgam worldview, um, the the main tool of that of that modernist turn away from all of that was ultimately skepticism, as you point out, right? It was this sort of reduction of of what we what we classically thought of as reason from all the functions of the mind down to yeah. deductive logic in particular. Yeah. And, and so if that's, if that's all you're willing to trust, at least at first, then getting back to everything else, I mean, it's going to take at least, Oh, I don't know, five, 600 years. Um, <laughs> Because I mean, I will say there's been a recent trend towards neo Aristotelianism uh, in a lot of a lot of branches of philosophy. So uh, maybe we maybe we're getting back to I don't know the fourth century BC at this point. Um, we've only got you know three thousand years to get back to uh, to uh, sorry no 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 we've only got like two thousand years to get back to the place of Aquinas. So, so we'll get there. Those are rough estimates, right? <laughs> how are you, how are you? <laughs> oh well, I'm I'm just saying if we are if we are, I don't know. I, this is this is me being being a little the bit the pace like that cheeky, we're at. But, is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Oh, I mean, if we if we're following trend lines and we just say that okay, well, basically the <clears throat> the uh, the the early moderns were were something like the Eleatic school, uh, the pre-Socratic, so the Eleatics in particular, which were uh, which were largely materialist, largely uh, skeptics. <clears throat> uh, they didn't they didn't believe in essences. They rejected that that idea. Atomists, things like that. Um, if we say that uh, the at this point we're encountering something like a Plato, Platonic and Aristot neo Aristotelian revival period, uh, that puts us roughly at the fifth or so century BC in terms of you know, philosophical history. So you know another two thousand years, we'll, we'll get back to Aquinas. That's all. Yeah, I don't well, know. I'm I, again. I I hope I'm joking, but who knows? You know? <laughs> well, good. I I really appreciate your time and your yeah. your expertise i think this is a really yeah, glad to be here. helpful discussion for for our class and i'd say even me in in particular i do appreciate um your time so glad to. uh yeah thanks for the discussion and um hey maybe we'll we'll have you on again sometime to talk about other topics we'll right, see I'd love to. all right we'll see you next Great. time then.